Central Gospel Church, Pastor Mensa Utabu. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We give God praise and we honor him for this morning. And rise up. I know you are standing wherever you are in your home. And we make this declaration of excellence in this year of excellence. Are you ready? Say with me, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. The Lord my God causes the righteous to shine forth as the sun. His awesome hand has formed me. His creative spirit inspires my mind. He skillfully guides my hands. Therefore, I boldly declare, I am set apart for excellence. The ruler of the universe has exalted my horn among the nations. He sets my feet on high. In his strength, I rise. By faith, I press forward towards the prize of my highest calling. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. He is the vine. I am the branch. In him I abide. In him I blossom. As it is written, God who commanded light out of darkness has shown his light in our hearts. We have his treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In this year, I commit to excellence. I commit to exceptionalism. I commit to do the extraordinary. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen and amen and amen. And you may be seated wherever you are in God's presence. It's a great joy to uh, welcome you to the service and to be part of this uh, congregation as we worship the Lord and as we praise him and as we listen to his word. Anytime we make this declaration and talk about uh, in this year, I commit to excellence, I commit to ex exceptionalism and the extraordinary, I'm reminded of the times that we live in. We live in very interesting times when it looks like uh, everything is going down, but in this year, we commit to excellence, we commit to be exceptional, we commit to do the extraordinary. No matter what is going on around us in our world, we are going to be on top, we're going to rise, we're going to have the victory, and we're going to come out of this stronger than ever before. Somebody say, I am going to excel. Oh yes, we will excel in this season, and it is our season. If you remember, uh, two weeks ago, I started a series that I titled, it's a new season, and I did part one two weeks ago, and I did part two uh, last week, and today I'm doing part three of It's a New Season. I truly believe that this is a new season. God is opening a new door of opportunity for us. It may not be familiar. It may not be comfortable. It may not be what we would wish for or expect, but God is going to use this to our advantage and it's a new season for us. So we go into the scriptures to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and uh, verses 1 to 3. Most of you might have heard this passage read before. You might have read it yourself, uh, but it's a familiar passage in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. And let's hear the reading of God's word. To everything. There is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. It's a very interesting passage of scripture that talks about contrasting activities taking place at different times. And some of those contrasts are very, very different from each other. Some of them we wish would, there would be no time for. 
uh, for, for, for example, it says there is a time to kill, a time to break down, a time uh, to pluck what is planted. It, it simply says that although some things may not seem appropriate and comfortable for us, there are times that when they occur, they seem right to us. And, uh, and that is just what it's saying. And the passage says that to everything, there is a season. Everything in this world has a season. And a season is a set period during which things happen. A set period during things happen. Everything has a time when it happens. And then it says every purpose has a time. The word purpose means that which we delight in or desire. That which we delight in or desire. For everything we delight in or desire, there is a time. And the word time uh, as it is used in the context of that scripture means the right moment for something to happen. So there is a right moment for everything we desire in and delight in to happen. There is a right moment for it to happen. When things happen at the wrong time, that is when we see abnormality. But when things happen in the right time, we see uh, beauty uh, in them. Normally, uh, for, for us in the English language, uh, time is time. So when somebody says, it's my time, or it is time, let's be on time, uh, we use the word time, and, and, and although the meaning uh, may be different, so when somebody says, let's be on time, it means let us go according to the clockwork. If the appointment is supposed to be 12.30, let's be there at 12.30. When somebody says, it's my time, he's not talking about a clock time. He's talking about that a moment has come for me, for something good to happen to me. But we use the same word, time, to refer to the clockwork and time to refer to opportunity. But in the Greek language, uh, time uh, has different words and there are two that I want to emphasize on. The first one is chronos. Chronos in, in, in the Greek language is time, but it's chronological time. Time that can be measured in distance. Uh, whether it's long or short, or, or you, you can literally say watch time. Chronos. That's why the watch is called a chronograph. Time that can be measured. Chronos. But there is another word for time that the Greeks use, and it is kairos. And kairos simply means a season when things happen. A season when things happen. So when somebody says, it's my time, for example, we are not talking about chronos. We are not talking about watch time. We are talking about a season for something to happen to me. And when somebody says, I have to be on time for the appointment, we are talking about watch time. These are the two differences. But in English, we use the same word time, whereas in Greek, there are different words for them. So for our study today, when we are talking about it's a new season, we are not talking about clock time. We are talking about an appointed time, a season when things must happen to us. And we'll focus our study today on how God brought a new season in the life of a beloved couple in the Bible. They had served God for years, yet they have not had the thing that they desired most happening to them. Their purpose is not happening. The, the, the desire, the delight is not manifesting. And we know the couple because we've encountered them many times in the Bible. Abraham and Sarah. And their greatest desire is for a child. Particularly a boy child, a son. And for years, they've desired a child. And after a long time, uh, when they're now very advanced in age, uh, they, they've given up hope of having that child. And just when it seemed like it will never happen, there will not be a time for this purpose to be achieved. It looked like a desire which will never find time of expression. 
just when they thought that this desire of ours, this purpose of ours, will never have a time for it to happen, something happens. They have a visit, and that visit changes everything. It changed their season from dryness to fruitfulness. There are moments in our lives when we think that something we desire will never have its season, but then God visits, and when God visits, what we thought will never happen, he creates a moment for it to happen. And I pray that that season will be yours. And so I'm going to focus my attention uh, on Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. I am not going to read the entire chapter, although it will be good for you later on to read the entire chapter. But for the brevity of time, I'm going to pick selected Verses from Genesis chapter 18 to tell the story and to teach the lesson. So we first look at verse number 1. Genesis chapter 18, verse number 1. And it says, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Although no name is mentioned here, the he there is Abraham. And the picture that verse 1 paints for us is a normal day for Abraham. A normal day for him and his wife, Sarah. They are at home. They are minding their own business. It's a hot day because the Bible talks about the heat of the day. And, and Abraham, uh, probably because the weather is hot or maybe it's his habit, is sitting outside the tent just whiling away the time, and his wife, Sarah, is in the tent. This is a normal day. It's a sunny day. Uh, the tent is there. Sarah is in the tent. Abraham is sitting outside the door of the tent. Then he sees three men coming, three guests, and they are on their way by the tent to go wherever they are going. Somehow, Abraham feels that these are important people he invites them to come to his tent. He tells Sarah, go and get some meal and prepare some food for these visitors. So they prepare the food for these visitors. But these visitors are not just human visitors. They are angelic visitors on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah, passing by Abraham's tent. And when they finished eating, they announced a new season. For Abraham and Sarah. And may God bring you a new season in your life. And so in Genesis chapter 18 verse 9 and 10. We read these words. Then they said to him. Where is Sarah your wife? Then he said. Here in the tent. And he said. I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Out of nowhere, a new announcement comes to Abraham and Sarah. I will visit you according to the time of life. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. I want you to note the phrase, time of life. And there are two ways to translate that phrase, time of life. And theologically, there are two positions on it. First, it is understood as a year from now. So that phrase means a year from now. That's one way to interpret it. Another way it is understood is time of life talks about the gestation period for life. That is nine months. So when a woman becomes pregnant and de uh, delivers a baby, uh, it's the time of life. It's a nine-month period. So some people interpret this as one year or as nine months. Whether it's a one-year time or a nine-month time, it simply means within a year. So Sarah hears a message that says within a year, you will have a son. The statement is so bold. It's so audacious. 
that Sarah laughs. It's almost like somebody hears something that is too good to be true. And when you hear it, you say, ah, as for this one, I don't think it will happen. That's what Sarah is saying. It's too good to be true. It, 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 it is flabbergasting. It is out of this world. It is impossible. But it's from God. God says to Sarah, what you have waiting for, that desire that you thought there will be no time and there will be no season for it, within a year, I will create a season for it and it will happen. And when Sarah heard it, she laughed. I'm sure if you hear something like that, you would laugh. God can give you a message that is so big and out of this world that your immediate response is to laugh at it because it defies logic. And today I pray that God will bring you into a season that defies logic. That when you hear it, your first response is to laugh and say, ah, as for this one, it's too big. May God do something that your mind cannot comprehend and your vision cannot even grasp now. So Sarah hears and she laughs. Then the angel of the Lord spoke again. In verse 13 and verse 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. When Sarah heard this, she says, shall I have bear a child since I'm old? So she's, she's referring to time because old is the effect of time. When time has been against you and time has fought you and time has resisted you and time has been delayed, you come to a season or a place in your life where you think according to the time schemes of life, it is impossible for me to have a child. So she says, Kronos is against me. The clock is against me. The calendar is against me. I have lived for too long. I am on retirement. Time is not on my side. So God is speaking about time. She is also speaking about time. But her time is a clock time. God's time is appointed time. So Whereas God says, I'm going to give you a season, she says, I don't have clock time. In other words, the calendar doesn't favor me. It's almost like God says, I'm going to bless you and, and make you rich. And you say, but I'm on retirement. Retirement is your age, which has now disqualified you. But what God is saying has nothing to do with clock time. It has to do with appointed time. It's a new season. It has nothing to do with the calendar. So she says, according to my reckoning, time is against me. Kronos is against me. Listen to God's response. At the appointed time, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, And I'm going to explain those two phrases because they are very powerful phrases. At the appointed time, somebody say, God has an appointed time for me. Somebody say, I have an appointment with destiny. So God says to Sarah, you say you are old. And the reason you say you are old, because you check your calendar, you check your birthday, and according to your birthday markings, you are probably getting to 90 years old, and it is impossible by every human theory for a human 
woman to give birth to a child at 90. Even in these days of scientific advancement and all the kinds of things that the scientists can do and the doctors can do, I have never heard of that happening. Maybe we'll get there when science will catch up with God. But so far, that's an impossibility by every stretch of the imagination. So Sarah is saying, according to chronos, according to time, the clock says it can happen. God says, I'm not working with clock. I'm working with appointed time. I'm working with season. So he uses the phrase at the appointed time. Somebody say, I have an appointed time. The Hebrew word for appointed time is moed. Moed. And it simply means a place of meeting. A place of meeting. It is a word that is used in the Old Testament to refer to periods that God sets apart to meet his people, Moed. So when God says the people should meet him in the temp temple or the tabernacle or he would visit them or he would meet them on the mountain, that's what he means. So when he says an appointed time, he's not even referring to date and months. He's referring to a place in the realm of the spirit when God intervenes in the story of mankind. So what God is talking about is Kairos. What Sarah is talking about is Kronos. I don't have the time. God says, I have the time because I'm not working according to your clock. I'm working according to your season. To everything, there is a time. 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 To everything. So God says... I have an appointed time with you, a pre-arranged meeting and a place of meeting. God says, I have set an appointment for you, Sarah. I have pre-arranged a schedule for you. And then he says, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. So there are two times here. God says, at the appointed time, I will return within the time of life. So God says, within the time of life. Remember, I said the time of life is within a year. Within a year or within nine months, within a year, at the appointed time, according to the normal gestation period for a woman to conceive and have a child, within that chronological period, I will create a divine appointment for you. So sometimes God is able to superimpose his time over your time. Your time says I have only a short period. I have only one year. I have only six months. I have only three months. I have only seven days. I have only one day, God says, within that simple time, I will create my kairos. So God is able to intervene in our time in a way that superimposes his time over our time. And that is the message I have for somebody. Remember, throughout this COVID period, I've been saying that this moment it's a moment set apart for planting and for building. I have said over and over, this is a moment for the previously disadvantaged to be advantaged. I have said over and over, this is the time for a people group who for seasons in the past have struggled for relevance and have never had it. It seems as if their best days are over. But I have said it that in this time, God will visit his people. God will use this time of life to establish his appointed time. He will use this time of life to establish his appointed time. You know, when, especially when we talk about uh, African development and everybody, uh, we, we, we talk about the, the good old days. You know, that's one phrase I, I don't particularly like, good old days. What is good old days? 
If your good old days are in the past, you are saying that your life is retrogressive. Our better days are always ahead of us. And I, I understand why people talk about the good old days. They talk about the days of Kwame Nkrumah and the days of Jurios Nyerere, Nyerere and the days of uh, so and so. And, and they mention the names of, of all these people who have gone ahead. Even in those days, in the days of Patrice Lumumba, we never made it. We never had success. Well, God is having a new appointment with us. And this new appointment is not according to the past. It's according to a new time shadow. And God is telling us what was impossible to achieve in the best times, I will achieve for you in the worst of times. Can you hear that? God is saying what was impossible to achieve in the best of times, I will achieve with you in the worst of times. The best time for Sarah to have had a child was probably 70 years earlier. When she was probably in her 20s or her teens. Fertile, ready, able. That's when to have a child. That's the best of time. It didn't happen in the best of times. And God waited for the worst of times. In the worst of times, he created an appointment. And in that appointment, at the time which is considered the worst time ever for something good to happen, became the best time for God. So God says, at the appointed time, according to the time of life, I will return. I will visit you. Did God return? Did he honor his word? Yes, he did. And just something for you, for, for you to note. This whole encounter that Abraham and Sarah are having with the angel of the Lord, it's almost like a parenthesis. It's, it's like uh, God is doing something else. And in between what he's doing, he finds time to do this. Because the purpose of this angelic mission is to go to Sodom and Gomorrah who have been doing some bad things and they're about to get judgment. And in the process, they visit Abraham and Sarah. So two things are happening at the same time. There is destruction for Sodom and Gomorrah, but there is life for Abraham and Sarah. So sometimes in the midst of what we call chaos and disorder, God is able to create a new season in parenthesis for a people who are on his plan. And that is why I believe in this global chaos, God is creating a parenthesis for the African continent. And it is our time for planting and for building. And I announce to you, you may see destruction all around you. You may see failure all around you, but you are in God's parenthesis. He has made space for you. He has made room for you. He has made an appointment for you and he will visit you. Did he honor his word? Well, Genesis chapter 21 verse 1 and 2 says this. This is the record of scripture. And the Lord visited Sarah as he has said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he has spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. Did God show up at the appointed time? Yes, sir. He did not miss the appointment. And that's one thing about God. When he makes an appointment, he doesn't miss the appointment. At the set time, he visited Sarah. The interesting thing is the first time the visit took place a year ago, the angel of the Lord, three angelic visits take place. This visit, there is no angel, but the visit takes place. So whether you see an angel or you don't see an angel, God is able to visit you. If you are waiting for, for to see angels showing up to say, oh, then God has visited me. God visits 
even when we don't see any physical evidence of a visitation. He visited Sarah and honored his word. Last thing I want to touch on before I close. When you look at the Sarah story of Sarah, it looks as if all of these things is happening and she doesn't believe it. And she's laughing at it. So when you only look at the account in Genesis, it will seem as if this woman didn't believe anything and it happened. It is only in the New Testament that we are giving a commentary on Sarah that helps us to put her actions in proper perspective. So final scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. And I like that. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky, a multitude innumerable as the sun which is by the seashore. By faith, Sarah herself. So she didn't end the day laughing. When she heard the promise, it seemed like laughter to her. But when she, it was confirmed, she believed it. She believed it. She moved from unbelief to faith. And the Bible says she believed the promise. And I want you to believe the promise of God. And when she believed the promise, the Bible says she received strength for her body. Her body was rejuvenated. It became youthful again. She believed the promise. She received strength. Then the third thing the Bible says is that she conceived seed. Something her body was not made for at that age happened. She conceived seed and she bore a child. And I like how Hebrews clarifies it. It says she bore a child when she was past the age. When the chronological time was against her, divine appointment slaughtered her into a new season. My job is to let you know that within a chronological arrangement of 2020, which seemed like the most wasted year on the planet Earth, I have heard people say God should replay 2020. He will not replay 2020. Because in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction, there is a parenthesis for Abraham and Sarah. I don't know what is happening to the whole world, but for you and your house, for me and my house, God is creating a parenthesis of divine visitation. There is a space. There is, there is a cocooning of God's presence. And in this moment, you would see the visitation of God. And within this time of life, within this 2020, within this time of life, when everybody says everything has been destroyed, everything has gone up, you will call 2020 as the year of the beginning of your lifting up. You would say in the year when there was the coronavirus, when everything was in chaos, the Lord helped me to build this. In the year when everybody said things are down, God lifted me up. May the Lord create a divine appointment for you in this season of your life. And I have every confidence there is a bold, audacious, ridiculously fantastic promise of God for you. It may seem like a laughable matter, but you have to be like Sarah. You must believe the promise. You must receive strength. And you must conceive the seed and give birth to that miracle that God has appointed for you. I believe God has visited you. I believe he will do great things for you. I believe he will honor his name in your life. So this morning before I close, I just want you to talk to the Lord. He's your God. He's your father. I want you to just lift up your hand to him as a sign of faith. And I want you to begin to talk to God and say, Lord, I believe your promise to me. I believe your set appointment for me. 
I believe that in this Kairos moment, in this divine appointed time, you will overrule the time of life. You will overrule what time has done to me. Time has made me old. Time has withered me. Time has destroyed my work. Time has destroyed the work of my hand. But I trust you that by your divine season, you will cause something new to come out of me. Just talk to the Lord. Just talk to the Lord this morning, wherever you are, at home, in your hotel, in your office, wherever you are watching this. There is a visitation of God coming your way. God has a package for you. He has your name on it. Your name is on that package. God will visit you. God will show himself strong unto you. You will begin to count days and times from this year. This is not a wasted year. This is not a destructive year. It may destroy others, but you will have life. Sodom and Gomorrah may be destroyed, but Abraham and Sarah will have life. In the midst of chaos, there is order. In the midst of destruction, there is productivity. When everybody is going down, you will rise up. Let this be the beginning of divine visitation. Just talk to the Lord. Talk to him. Talk to him from your heart. Talk to him from your spirit. Cry out to him. He hears you. He knows your need. He hears your cry. Time has fought you, but divine appointment will favor you. Time has fought you, but divine appointment will favor you. Father, thank you. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you for your promises, which are yes and amen. When it seems like time is not on our side, you create appointments for us. And for everyone listening to me, Lord, today who has believed, may you create an appointment for us. May you create space for them. May you create a new season for them. A season of your visitation and a season of your return. May you touch them. May you restore them. May you cause them to overflow. May you do something that is fantastically, boldly audacious out of this world. May it happen to them in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. If you believe that, why don't you celebrate the Lord and give him praise wherever you are. Thank him in your room, in your hotel, wherever you are. Give a shout of praise. Give a shout of rejoicing. Thank God for his divine season and his divine visitation. Somebody say, God has an appointment with me. Amen. We're going to receive our offering. And I just want you to give generously as the Lord has blessed you. Anytime you hear the word of God that registers with your spirit. You have to take an action that is corresponding to the faith you have inside of you. And I just want you to give as an expression of your confidence that God will do what he has promised you. The word of God will not fall to the ground. It will not go and return void. The band will minister to us in song as we receive the offering. Give as your purpose in your heart.